let me introduce Jim Lawler. Uh, I met Jim when he was teaching a human course years and years ago. And I have to say it was it was absolutely one of the best courses I've ever taken in human intelligence operations. I learned so much in the course and um, most of it I can't really go into, but <laughs> I will say that I just, I learned a, a great deal. And on Jim's background, besides just being just a phenomenal uh, human operator. He was a case officer for roughly 25 years with the CIA, uh, serving in international posts from 1998 through his retirement in 2005. His specialization was in the recruitment of foreign spies, and half of his career was focused in weapons of mass destruction, countering the proliferation of those. He was the chief of the AQCon nuclear takedown team, and this resulted in the disruption of the most dangerous nuclear weapons network in history. Mr. Lawler was the recipient of the CIA's Trailblazer Awards in 2007, and George Tennant has referred to his achievements as the most spectacular intelligence accomplishments in the history of the CIA. He's also received the Director's Award from Director Tennant, as well as the U.S. Intelligence Community's Human Collector of the Year Award and Donovan Award from the CIA's Deputy Director of Operations. So obviously, the details of the operations that he was involved in are still classified, and he can't go into the details of those. However, he... Um, has captured the essence of these operations in two novels that have recently been published. The first is Living Lies, and this is an espionage story about the Iranian nuclear weapons program. And the second novel, In the Twinkling of an Eye, is about a covert Russian North Korea genetic bioweapons program. He's currently working on a third novel, The Traitor's Tale, which is about treachery and treason within the CIA. And with that, I will be quiet and let uh, Jim go ahead and speak. Thank you very much, Matt. So let me tell you a little bit about my background. I was in my third year of law school at the University of Texas. And like anybody in their last year of graduate school or college, you're only focused on one thing, and that thing is getting a job. And the CIA was coming to campus to recruit attorneys for the Office of General Counsel, because like any big bureaucracy, the CIA needs a whole raft of attorneys to either keep it out of trouble or get it out of trouble. And so I went to this interview with a gentleman named Mr. Bill Wood, and we spoke for about three or four minutes, and suddenly he said, Jim, have you ever thought about the clandestine service? Now, this was in 1976, and I looked at him quizzically, and I said, I absolutely don't know what the clandestine service is. He laughed, and he said, well, I can't tell you much about it, but I think you'd be good at this. So that intrigued me, but the sad fact was, at that time, my wife's mother was very, very ill, and there was no chance that we were going to be moving away from Houston, Texas, to Washington, D.C., and ultimately overseas, thousands of miles away. So instead of going to work for the CIA, I joined a family business. Now, I don't know how many of the 36 of you who are out there listening to this have ever been part of a family business, but I suspect there's a reason why you're no longer a part of a family business, and it probably has to do with that F-word family. I, I love my dad and my two brothers, and I was making a heck of a lot of money, more money than I would ever make in the rest of my life. And I was miserable, completely miserable. And I'd come home and complain about it to my wife. And finally, after about three and a half years of my constant complaining, she said, Jim, either do something about it or stop your belly aching. So I wrote to Mr. Wood a letter that night. And three days later, I had a phone call from a young woman who never identified herself as being with the CIA. All she said was, you wrote Mr. Wood a letter, and he was wondering if you might be available for a conversation this coming Thursday at 3 o'clock at the Holiday Inn on the Gulf Freeway. 
And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, then please be in the lobby. I showed up. We went to his room and we talked for about two hours. And he decided, he said, I'd like to fly you to Washington for a round of interviews and tests. So I went two weeks later for about three days of interviews and tests. Three months later, I was invited to come back and take a polygraph exam. I don't know how many of you have ever had a polygraph exam. They're not pleasant. But I did that, passed that, passed the shrink exam. Lord knows how I passed that. And about three months after that, I received a phone call, and they said they would like to offer me a job as a GS-11, that's a government-grade CIA operations officer. Now, the bizarre and ironic, really bizarre thing was I had no idea what a CIA operations officer does. But I was so miserable in my family job, I said, that sounds good to me. So a couple of months later, we moved to Washington. My wife was pregnant with our first child. And I started at work at the CIA on February 19th, 1980, not having a clue about what they wanted me to do. And pretty quickly, though, I discovered exactly what they expected of me. They expected me to manipulate people, to exploit people, to subvert people, to suborn people, to convince them to commit treason, to betray a trust. And I found out that not only was I pretty good at it, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. That's the sociopathic side of being a CIA case officer, being able to control others. So I call this talk that I give Soul Catcher because of this quote, from the founder of the British Secret Service in the 16th century. And it's literally true. In order to recruit somebody, I get inside their head and I essentially I capture their soul. I love this quote from Cormac McCarthy in this book, No Country for Old Men, because it was certainly true about my first substantial recruitment, which was on my very first tour, about how things just happen sometimes and you can't control them. They don't require your permission. I was in a, my first assignment, and anytime you're in a uh, CIA assignment as a case officer, your first tour, you're expected to recruit clandestine sources. In other words, I was a spy recruiter, and we received a cable, a classified cable from CIA headquarters, saying that in the next year, we were going to be embarking upon a... Um, a series of negotiations with a uh, country, these negotiations were going to lead to a treaty that would have significant impact on our national security. And unfortunately, we had not a clue as to what the other side's negotiating positions were. So the plea from CIA headquarters was, we need you to recruit sources who might have an insight into this country's negotiating strategies for this very critical treaty coming up. As luck would have it, I had met a man who met the criteria. I'd met him in a ski, ski class, and we had gotten along fine. So I intensed what we call our developmental activities. That's where you're building the friendship, building the trust, so that you can get to a point where you can gauge what is it that this man or woman needs? How can we appeal to them? And how can we persuade them, essentially, to become a spy, to commit treason? And after a few weeks of rather intense socialization and development of, development of what I thought was trust and a friendship, I persuaded our headquarters that I could pitch this man to become a spy. And CIA headquarters was so desperate, <laughs> they absolutely went around, went along with my very, very naive proposal. I'd never pitched anybody in my life. And I thought I could do this based simply on the sheer power of my personality, which is foolish in the extreme. But CIA headquarters approved it. So I took this gentleman out to dinner and I explained to him that this treaty was going to be a very, very crucial, of crucial importance to the United States. And I proceeded to offer him a fair amount of money if he could give us privileged insights into their negotiating positions. In other words, I was offering him a fair amount of money 
simply to be a spy for the United States and give us their positions. This guy looked at me and he said, Jim, let me say something here. He said, you and I are friends, but this would be morally wrong. Now, I've pitched 50 or 60 people in my life, and he was the only one who ever posed a moral objection. Most of the time, if somebody objects, it's due to fear. I had one fellow that I pitched. He was an African intelligence officer. And he said, Jim, in my country, they hang people for doing things like this. And he was right. They would. But then he stunned me when he said, but could I have a rain check? I said, a rain check? He said, yes, sir. My child here is only three years old. I don't need you now, but in 15 years, he'll be college age. I might need you then. And I wrote that down in a file. And 15 years later, when he was posted to Washington, the uh, division responsible for his country came to me and asked me, do you think your friend meant that? I said, yes, I do. And we cashed that rain check in 15 years later. But go back to my story here. I'm disappointed. This is my first big recruitment pitch. And my friend has turned me down. And so I backed off very quickly. And it suddenly occurred to me, there was a saying at CIA that it's okay to get turned down. But it's not okay if you get turned in. Meaning, what if this fellow went and reported my recruitment pitch to his ambassador? And then his ambassador, in my mind's eye, would storm into our ambassador's office and lodge a very, very strong diplomatic protest about how outrageous it was that Mr. Lawler would proceed to proposition a member of his embassy. In fact, it was his deputy, the deputy chief of mission. So the number two guy in his embassy, I had just pitched to commit espionage, and I could just see this this ambassador, this foreign ambassador, throwing a fit about the fact that I had the audacity of pitching his deputy to be a traitor. Well, it, I thought, you know, I need to call this guy up and see if, in fact, we're still friends. I've just got to take his temperature. So two or three days later, when I finally got my courage up, I did call him. And the first thing that reassured me a little bit was he didn't hang up in my ear. And I said to him, we had such a good time the other night. I was wondering if maybe we could go out to dinner again this next Friday. My goal simply was, I want to smooth this, whatever you know disturbance there is in the flow here in the force, I want to smooth that out and make sure that he didn't report me and that we're still friends. Well, I was very relieved when he said to me, when I said, let's go out again, he said, oh, Jim, you know, I was thinking maybe that would be a good idea. Let's do that. So I thought, okay, good. So a few days later, and this is exactly a week after I'd pitched him, we go to a very nice restaurant. And I still remember the uh, waiter came over, dropped the menus down in front of us, walked away, the first words out of my friend's mouth, Jim, that offer you made me last week, is that still good? I was a bit surprised. I said, but yeah, of course it is. I made that offer to you because we're friends. And he said, well, what you don't know was that a couple of days after our dinner, my wife announced that she wants a divorce. And I can't afford to pay her the alimony to which she's entitled and pay for my boy's private school when we go back to my home country next year. Because in my country, they have to have a private education or it they just don't get a good education. He said, I can't, I can't do that, any of that, unless I accept your offer. And I know it's morally wrong. Well, I started to say something about that. But then I remembered another thing I'd learned in law school is that if the judge rules in your favor, shut up and get out of court quickly. So I shut up. And he got into becoming a spy. And he started bringing out stacks of classified material from his embassy. And the first time he did that, as he handed me five or six inches worth of classified intelligence from his embassy, he said to me, you know, Jim, 
what I've not told you before is I hate my ambassador. He is a cocky son of a bitch who goes around stealing credit for everything that I do and everything that everyone else in the embassy does. And he says, I can't, I can't stand that guy. And he says, as I hand you this classified material, it's as if I'm kicking that son of a bitch in the face. I, I chuckled and I said, you know, you and I are buddies and a great team. Why don't you steal some more of this and let's kick that son of a bitch again? And he laughed and boy, did he get into it. And I learned fairly early in my career that revenge is one of the purest motivations for espionage because otherwise people, if you're raised with the normal upbringing, you learn that you don't betray your family, you don't betray your friends, you don't betray your country. But if you feel like you've been betrayed first, there's a self-justification. The Jesuits call this covert compensation. And boy, did he get into it. He basically compromised their crypto systems, everything you know that was encrypting their, their classified communications. And then we were concerned about what would happen when he goes back to his country next year and becomes a spy on these negotiations. And my headquarters wanted to make sure that he was a legitimate spy for us, only on our side, and was not what we call a double agent. It was unlikely because of the classified material he was giving me, but he was going to be handled by one of my colleagues who does not have diplomatic protection. We call that a non-official cover officer, a NOC. A NOC is a deep cover CIA officer, typically posing as a business person. They do not have diplomatic protection. And so if my friend, in fact, were a double agent, they could com he could compromise my colleague and my colleague would go to jail and could rot in prison. So headquarters wanted my friend to go through a counterintelligence polygraph. Now, I'm not a big believer in polygraphs, but this one was going to be a three-issue, very simple counterintelligence polygraph. And the questions would be, have you told anyone about your secret relationship with CIA? That's pretty easy, yes or no. Number two, are you working for any intelligence organization other than CIA? Again, that should be pretty easy. And the third question is, did some intelligence or security organization direct you to accept Mr. Lawler's offer? Meaning, are you a double agent? And again, that should be a very black and white yes or no. Well, the polygrapher, the operator, is supposed to stick to those three questions and not go off on a fishing expedition unless the uh, subject gives the permission to the operator to do so. Well, in this case, as luck would have it, I had a very naive first tour polygrapher who'd never been overseas before and who probably had met very few foreigners in his life. And the first question out of the polygrapher's mouth to my friend was, golly, I'm just curious why you're doing this. And I thought, oh, gosh, now this is going to open up a Pandora's box. He's going to have his moral epiphany. And he's going to storm out of this room. I was surprised. He laughed and he said, because I think this is going to be a lot of fun. He was a thrill seeker, which is another motivation sometimes for people to commit espionage. Well, he didn't disappoint us. He uh, went on back to his home country. And he was able to give us all of the negotiating positions that his country had in this uh, treaty negotiation. And he gave us not only their positions, he gave us their fallback positions. And finally, he gave away the uh, position where they would walk away if we did anything other than that. It's like if you were buying a house or a car, wouldn't you like to know the bottom dollar that the seller would accept? And otherwise, they would say, forget it. And that's exactly what he gave us. It was calculated that over the next several years that our ability to reach that successful treaty negotiation saved the United States tens of billions of dollars and had a major impact on our national security. 
I was a rock climber when I was a uh, young man. And in order to climb rocks, you got to look for the crack system so that you can put your fingers and toes in it. And people are a lot like rocks. I mean, they've got crack systems. Everybody does. Everybody's under stress. And my talent was being able to find exactly what the stress was and then relieving the stress. And I also discovered that you don't recruit people when you're in transmit mode. You recruit people when you're listening. In essence, I became a student of human frailty. And I like to say that never once in my career did I ever recruit a happy person. You don't recruit happy people. You recruit people who are unhappy, who are bitter, who are going through a a bleak period. Sometimes we would have a a visual out on a, a foreign embassy. Could have been a Russian one, whatever. And we would watch as they come out leaving work. And if it's a group of four or five people slapping each other in the back and joking as they head off to a bar, we ignore those people. What we are looking for is the loner, the person who comes out by himself, a person who doesn't feel like he's part of that team. About the time of my fourth tour, I received another cable from CIA headquarters, and they informed the field that we needed some sources in a certain country where we had not been able to recruit anybody for a number of uh, almost almost 18 months. And I looked up the diplomatic list and discovered that uh, there was a a newly arrived diplomat from this particular country. So I simply cold called him, noted that I had arrived a few weeks earlier than him, and asked him if he'd like to go to lunch. And he said, sure, would love that. So we went to lunch, discovered while we were at lunch that we both share a hobby of long distance running. And so and he and I became good buddies and we became running friends on the weekends. Almost every weekend, he and I would go on a long distance run. Now, there was a big difference between him and me. The difference was he was a world class marathoner and I am not. But that allowed me to shut up as I was breathing hard, and he would just chatter away and tell me a lot of interesting things about his embassy and about what was going on in his life. But not once did I ever detect any vulnerabilities or stresses. He was from a uh, ethnic group in his country that was the predominant, uh, the, the group in power, I should say. They dominated the government, and it was a... Uh, the kind of thing where he was part of that ethnic group. He was, he was single. He was making good money as a first tour diplomat. He had no stress whatsoever. So we continued the development anyways, and he would tell me things out of basically things he shouldn't tell me, but never once did I detect a, um, the crack that I needed to recruit him. So I moved on to another post But our friendship was very, very strong. In fact, he called me and asked me if I would be best man at his wedding. That's how that's how intense these relationships go. And I quickly agreed, flew back to the country where he had been posted, was posted. And the night before his wedding, I kind of let him know that if he ever needed me, that he and I were like brothers and that I had special connections in Washington and I'd be happy to help him out as my brother. And he said he appreciated that. So I didn't really pitch him, but I just let him know this, you know, that this was a strong relationship and I would be there for him. So things happen as uh, my first slide said, he went on after marrying this young lady, they had a baby and were posted in another country, several thousand miles from her home country. And she decided that she had not signed on for this. She was homesick. She didn't like living in this other third world country thousands of miles away. And so one day she announced that she wanted a divorce and basically shattered his personal life, took the baby, flew home to her home country, and he was left there all alone. Eventually, he went back to his home country, to the capital. And in the time that he had, several years that he had been gone, his ethnic group basically lost power 
and a new ethnic group, a new racial group, came into power. And he discovered to his horror and frustration that no matter how much he worked, no matter how successful he was at his career, he could never be promoted again because he was not part of the now prevailing ethnic and racial group in his country. And that frustrated him a whole lot to the point where he wrote me and he said, Jim, I don't know how someone who's treated like this can give allegiance to the country that does that. How can, how can I give allegiance to a country which treats me like this? Well, that's like a big neon sign saying, come recruit me. So I said, look, I know you're going back to the country of your ex-wife to celebrate your daughter's third birthday. Why don't I meet you there? I've got a trip to Europe anyway. I'll go there and let's talk about some other job opportunities. So I flew there. Now I should add it has now been almost 11 years since I first met this guy. So this is what we call a long-term development. But I went there. I basically broke cover, told him that I was really a CIA officer, and that I appreciated the fact that if he had suspected that I was, that was what I was, that he never said anything about it. But I wanted to offer him an opportunity to join my team. And he looked at me and he said, Jim, I'd love that because that would be something to believe in. And so he did. He joined my team. He uh, also was polygraphed. He passed. He was the first person from his country to be recruited uh, in over a year and a half. He went back to his uh, ministry and 9-11 happened. And he told me later that he almost put himself under suspicion by his colleagues because he became very emotional as he saw the Twin Towers collapsing. And he said, you know, I was basically virtually crying. And my colleagues noticed and asked me why I was so upset about what was going on in America. And he said, what they didn't know is now I'm on your team. And this affected me. Well, he went on, had a very successful career working for us. He made a fair amount of money, actually more than a fair amount of money doing this. And now he is retired from the foreign ministry that he was part of, and he's got a very successful business. And he jokingly sometimes says to me, I wish I had a picture of you, Jim, because if I did, I'd put it up in my business with the caption, our founder. I, I, he and I still are in touch with each other and still refer to one another as brothers. So nobody ever commits espionage based on a single motivation. It's like a mosaic of motivations. And I'll tell you the um, thing, you know, respect. If you don't have respect and self-esteem, I'll give you all the respect you could ever need. The fact that I could tell some of my sources that the American president reads every word of what you tell me, that's a, that's a real, you know, a real huge amount of self-esteem for somebody. And as far as the uh, old boiling a frog, you know, the saying is you don't boil frogs in boiling water. You put them in lukewarm water and you gradually turn up the heat. And that's what I would do. I just need a small favor. And I'd come back and I'd say, you know, that conversation we had the other day, I wrote that up and I sent it to Washington. And this morning I was amazed when I found out that they gave me a performance award of two thousand dollars. But I can't I can't take that and t all of that. You know, you and I are a team. I think we need to share that because otherwise I'm stealing your intellectual property. And I'd have maybe $1,000 in an envelope. I'd slip it across to them. And the ironic thing was, is usually this, what they had told me was not classified at all. But then they would start thinking, well, if Jim would pay me $1,000 for that, what if I gave him something a little more sensitive? And so gradually, you know, I would get them to uh, become a spy for the United States. And the last story I'm going to tell you, because I know I don't want to run out of time, I was handling, I was the handler for a uh, asset of ours from a country which at one time had been friendly to the United States, but had been replaced, the government had been replaced 
by a set of people who are extremely hostile to the United States. And this particular asset of mine, this covert asset, he had been forcibly retired from his foreign ministry because he was part of the former regime. Now, he was not a very senior man, so they didn't, you know, they, he still got a pension and things like that. And a lot of people in his foreign ministry really liked him. Now, he was living in a European country that I was living in. And frequently, people from his home country would fly through the city that he was living in. And because he was such a nice guy and very popular, even though the politics were different now, they would have lunch or dinner with him. And he would just chat them up and they would tell him a lot of sensitive things. Some of it was classified, a lot of it wasn't, but it was the personal dynamics of the leadership. And folks back in Washington loved it because he would then write these reports up and give them to me. Well, he hit a stream of particularly exciting and valuable intelligence when a friend of his, who was also a retired foreign ministry fellow, his younger sister, who was working for the ministry, decided to come and spend three months in this very, very pretty uh, European country. And she basically took a sabbatical and going to spend the, the summer in this gorgeous, mountainous European country. And my friend offered to take this young lady out and show her the sights. And so they did. And she was just a little chatterbox and would tell him all about what was going on in the senior levels of the foreign ministry. And I was getting fabulous grades on my reporting. And I told him, I congratulated him. And he said, well, you know, Jack, which was the alias I was using, he said, Jack, you know, you could actually recruit this young woman. She's not anti-American like our government. She actually likes Americans. And I thought, well, gee, I wish I'd thought of that. But we have one very, very strong uh, rule in my organization, and that's that we will not jeopardize our clandestine sources. So I couldn't very easily pitch her or get an introduction from him to her, pitch her, and if she turned me down, she would automatically suspect that he, my friend, the guy that was taking her around, was also a CIA spy. So I devised a rather, I guess, you know, fairly clever ploy. I said, look, take this young woman to the following restaurant this next Friday night. Be there at 7 o'clock. And at 7.15, I'm going to come. And I'm going to stand up near the maitre d' as if I'm waiting for someone. And then I explained what I wanted him to do. Sure enough, he did it perfectly. He was seated there. I was standing up at the uh, entrance of the restaurant. And he looks over at me, turns to the young lady and said, ah, look, there's Mr. Jack Mitchell. I just met him at a cocktail party last Tuesday. Let me go say hello. Well, that was the you know, friendly thing to do. So he comes up, he reintroduces himself in her presence and uh, shakes my hand. He goes and sits down and I'm standing up there. A few minutes later, he says to her, he says, why don't we ask Mr. Mitchell to come over and share a drink until his friend comes? So he comes back over. He says, look, why don't you come over and sit with us until your friend shows up? I said, well, OK, but only until my friend shows up. So I go and I sit and get introduced to her. And I decided that in order not to spook her, I would not say that I was with the U.S. Embassy. But I would say that I was an oil and gas speculator, commodity speculator, because I knew that her country has a huge amount of oil and gas reserves. And boy, wouldn't it be great if you and I had lunch? And so she and I did have lunch. And I said, you know, I could really benefit from getting some insights into how your government is going to uh, price its barrels of oil and also it's natural gas. I mean, if I just had insight into what your strategy is, it could mean a lot of money for me. And if you would do that, I will give you this very generous um, consulting fee. Now, I also knew because of my friend told me that this young lady needed to have a surgical procedure 
that would require, it would take about 5000 the equivalent of about $5,000, and her ministry had refused to pay for it because she was not posted in this country. She's posted back home, and they said, look, we'll pay for it, but you've got to come home if you want that procedure. Well, she didn't want to break her sabbatical up. She knew that if she went home and had the procedure, they wouldn't let her come back to finish her three months of annual leave there in that beautiful country. So, of course, when I uh, propositioned her to become my consultant and give me privileged insights to the oil and gas market from her country, I naturally offered her a $5,000 signing bonus, and she was delighted. We celebrated with champagne, and she gave me a little bit of information about the oil and gas market. I went back to my office, which was about three hours away, and people back home were absolutely over the moon. They thought this was great. Now we've got a spy from her country. And my boss said how much the uh, chief of our division and the chief of station were loving the fact that I had recruited this young woman under a commercial pretense. But now I had to go back down, he said and tell her that I really work for the CIA and that I'm not an oil and gas commodities trader. And I said, well, Joe, why would I do that? And he said, because we want access to a lot more than their positions on the oil and gas market. And he said, also, you need to impress upon her that this is a very sensitive relationship. She can't go and tell people about it. He said it wouldn't be fair to her. She might start bragging about this consulting relationship to people and counterintelligence suspicions would increase. And finally, because we no longer have a diplomatic presence in her country, we need to equip her with a covert communications method. And at that point in time, you know, we didn't we couldn't explain that through a commercial pretext and she'll need to go through a polygraph test as well. So I went, oh, Lord. So I went back down, I broke cover, I told her that I was really a CIA officer, and I still remember her face. It was literally a look of horror. She looked like Bambi in the headlights, and she said, Jack, look, I like you, but what you're asking me to do is to become a spy. She said, the consulting, you know, that's a little on the margins, but uh, people do that. But now you're asking me to be a spy. She said, I can't do that. I know they'd see spy all over me. I could I can't go home and do that. She said, Look, I'll try and get you your money back, but I, I'm sorry, but you know, this this arrangement is finished. So I go back and tell my boss that she has just terminated the relationship. And actually, I was thinking, you know, she's a pretty smart gal. And uh, he looked at me, my boss did, and he said, Jim. What is it that I said the first time that you didn't understand? We're on the scoreboard and you want to take the score off? He said, you've got to go back down there and recruit that lady. Nothing like a little pressure. So I went out to a phone booth and I called her and I said, "Uh, I know you're leaving in a couple of weeks. And I thought maybe we could have a farewell dinner. And she said, you know, she said, okay, fine. I remember, you know, she wasn't mad at me per se, but she said, okay, that sounds good. So now I have a few days to think of some way to persuade this woman to become a spy for the United States. And I must say that this would be in a country where they execute spies. I came up with nothing. By the time I got on the train to go down and see her for that farewell dinner, I had no more of an idea of what to do than the first time. And so I got off the train, I went to the train station, and I saw a little gift shop. And I thought, okay, the decent thing to do would be to buy her a little going away present. So I bought her like a 10 inch high, very, very fragile, very beautiful bud vase and had it gift wrapped. And I took it off to my hotel. I had chosen a restaurant that evening It was on this gorgeous mountain lake, and the restaurant is one of the finest ones in all of Europe. The food is superb. The wine list is excellent. The service is world-class. Probably one of the most romantic restaurants I'd ever been to in my life. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about her. 
the women from her country are absolutely drop dead gorgeous. I mean, beautiful women. Their eyes are just gorgeous. They're like pools of of gold that you could fall into. They're just absolutely stunning, gorgeous women. However, she was not. And for those of you who've ever been on a blind date, those men in the audience, uh, you know, the first question you ask anybody who offers to set you up with a blind date is, what does she look like? And if the answer is, well, she's sweet and she's got a great sense of humor, you kind of know where this is going. And in fact, this lady, she was sweet. She had a good sense of humor. But even though she was in her early to mid-30s, she was still living with her mother and probably still living with her mom, but a sweet lady. So we had dinner in this gorgeous restaurant. I didn't try and persuade her to become a spy. We simply discussed our lives, our goals, you know, what we hope to do in life. Had a nice dinner, but I thought, well, this is a losing proposition. And I was about to give up after dessert and coffee had come when my foot touched the uh, bag that was holding this gift-wrapped vase. And I said, oh, I almost forgot this. And I pulled it out and I gave it to her. And she said, well, what is it? And I said, well, open it up. So she opened it up, and I said to her, I said, I thought that maybe you could take this home when you go back to your country in a couple of weeks, and if you want to, you could take it to the foreign ministry and put it on your desk, and when you look at it, you could think of me. So I'm looking at her, and I notice she's starting to cry, and I thought, what did I say that caused her to cry? And I leaned in and I heard her say something. And I leaned closer and she said, I can do this. And I said, pardon me? She said, I can do this. And I said, I know you can do it, but I said, I don't want you to do this if you don't really want to do it. And I meant that. I didn't want her to do it unless she really wanted it. But she wanted it. We trained her in covert communications. We polygraphed her. I remember she, uh, the polygrapher asked her if she was in the habit of lying, and she said, not until now, but you're asking me to lie to all of my colleagues and friends back home. Well, she went in, back into her home country, and I didn't tell you what her position was, but uh, she was a secretary in the foreign ministry, but she was a secretary to the foreign minister himself. So everything that he saw, we saw, and that included the identification of all of their people worldwide who were members of their intelligence service undercover, and a lot of other very crucial pieces of intelligence. She did this for five years and then temporarily lost her position, and whoever was her last handler did not equip her with what we call a recontact plan. Meaning, if you ever come into access of interesting information again, the next time you're out of your country, you need to contact this via this number. And a day or two later, someone will show up at the main train station, and they will have a picture of Jack or whomever as bona fides. And we found out subsequently why she was out of access, because she was in a special training program where she was going to go around and supervise the installation of every encrypted communication system in their worldwide network all over. And we never were able to recontact her, which was tragic. But for five years, she provided absolutely stunning intelligence. Now, before we get off this slide, I want to talk about that bottom line there about how some services, Russians, the Chinese, will use entrapment, threats, and blackmail. And I won't deny that that we've used these, we have. I personally don't like those techniques, not for the moral reasons, but simply because I do not want a rattlesnake in my back seat. I want somebody who wants to do this and who pos- is positively motivated to become my spy. There's an acronym called MICE. These are the supposedly the four uh, motivations for espionage. I agree totally with ideology. I agree that some governments use coercion. I think the thing that's 
motivates people the most, however, is ego. And part of that is revenge. Money is never a sole motivation for espionage. It may play a part. There may be financial needs. In my first friend's case, he needed money for the, uh, for the alimony. He needed money for his kids. Um, you know, people who are going through divorce are going through a very tumultuous time, psychologically tumultuous. It's like they're adrift at sea, and I become their life preserver. This just talks about some of the uh, things that, you know, how patients, things like that. Uh, internet profiles. Now, I didn't have that when I was active, but nowadays with Facebook and LinkedIn especially, you know, you can go and learn a lot about a lot of people and people that ultimately want to be recruited. People talk about Ed Snowden. Ed Snowden was not a technical penetration. He was a human penetration that enabled lots of technical penetrations. A seating operation is where you recruit someone who does not have access at the moment, but who is very talented and you seed them into an organization as a pre, basically a pre-existing spy. The Russians had a brilliant seeding operation called the Cambridge Five, where they recruited five British students at Cambridge and fed them into the intelligence and security services. These um, men were people like uh, uh, Anthony Blount, uh, John Cairncross, Guy Burgess, Donald McLean. The most famous one was Kim Philby. Kim Philby almost became the head of British intelligence. They had all been recruited at Cambridge, nominally Marxists, and were fed into the British security services. In fact, their intelligence was so good that Soviet counterintelligence suspected that they'd all been doubled. But in fact, they were legit. So people need things. And if you want to recruit folks, you have to be rather empathic. So this is how you make my life difficult. And basically, it's communicating and reducing the revenge motivation, be attuned to needs and stresses, and creating an atmosphere of trust. It's difficult to recruit people who feel like they're part of a team. I've worked against a lot of intelligence officers, and that's actually that's fair because it's a, a level playing field. So I'm going to give you 10 quick Keys to success for human recruiter, curiosity, listening ability, extreme empathy, patience, persistence, creativity, being an observer of stressors, ruthlessness, which is a pejorative term, but by that I mean not fearing rejection and never forgetting why you're doing this. In fact, I tell folks, I say, if you've never had a recruitment pitch rejected, you haven't pitched enough people. You have to continue to probe and find out, you know, what your limits are or if there are any limits. But the mod, you know, the uh, mediocre case officer is one who fears rejection or who fears that that person will get their feelings hurt. And that's part of, it's part of the uh, thing that you've got to take that on board. The final thing there, the understanding, the mastery of the metaphysics of recruiting. I strongly believe that those recruiters who are the best at this have an almost metaphysical connection with the target. When I'm pitching a target, it's as if nothing else exists in the universe for either the target or for myself. Explosions could be going off, but I'm linked into that person's mind, and it, it becomes a thing of sheer beauty. It's like watching a gifted athlete in the last 50 yards of their sprint, and you see that their arms and legs, it's like a blur, and they're bending time and space great book by Norman Mailer. And that's kind of the way I felt. I dedicate this, um, these presentations to one of my son's best friends, served with him as a Marine. And this is just the book, one of the books that, uh, Matt mentioned earlier in the program, and then the next slide is the uh, other book. So I'm going to open this up for questions. I've gone way over my time. I'm surprised that uh, Matt didn't yank the shepherd's crook at me. <laughs> <laughs>